All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the House Environment and Transportation Committee for a penultimate day of uh, bill hearings. We will start with Senator McKay, Garrett County Sheriff Salary Alteration, SB 521. Five oh nine, which is alter the salary of the sheriff of Garrett County. It passed your committee unanimously and the floor unanimously. So it's in the same posture. Just ask for grace and a favorable report, sir. Thank you. Any questions on SP 521? Okay. Thank you. I think we're going to see you tomorrow. So yes, sir. You coming yes, over. sir. Looking forward to it. I see uh, Senator West, SB 1067, Baltimore County Speed Monitoring Systems, Interstate 695. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's nice to be here. This is my first visit to uh, ENT in uh, a long time. So, and I'm not familiar with the uh, with the procedure. Do I have just two minutes or a little longer? Well, don't take advantage of it. We do not time the senators. So. Okay, I won't take advantage of it. Um, so this is a bill that arose um, because the Jones Falls Expressway speed camera in Baltimore City has worked brilliantly. I will admit I voted against the bill to authorize that two years ago. That was a mistake because the bill has worked, done exactly what the proponents expected it to do, which is slow the traffic down. And the amount of money that's being generated by the speed camera is far less than anticipated because the cars are traveling at a reasonable rate of speed. So I raised the issue before the, excuse me, before the Baltimore County Senate delegation, including all three Republicans um, earlier this year as to whether or not we should consider a speed camera uh, bill comparable to the Jones Falls Expressway bill on the Baltimore Beltway. Um, all of us have had experiences driving on the Beltway at a reasonable rate of speed and being passed by cars going by like rocket ships. Uh, it happened to me just this past week. I went back for an evening and both on my way home and my way back here, uh, car cars passed me going really fast, 90 to 100 miles an hour. So seven of the eight Baltimore County state senators voted in favor of this bill, presented it before the state Senate. It was overwhelmingly passed in my committee and then again on the Senate floor. What this bill does is authorize the state highway administration to place up to 16 speed cameras on the Baltimore Beltway, but only four can be in use at a single time. Um, the violations uh, will be a $40 fine, uh, so we're not talking about an astronomical amount of money, but hopefully it will cause drivers to slow down the Baltimore Beltway. Um, I learned uh, after having passed the state Senate that the uh, this committee has a special rule about speed cameras, and you have to provide accident data. So in the last five days, I got the State Highway Administration to give me this uh, piece of paper, which I believe everybody should have in front of them, which shows the outline of the beltway. And uh, in it's color-coded, so the parts of the beltway that have high speeding accident rates are in yellow, orange, and red. And then the low accident rates are in green. Interestingly, the low accident rate portion, portion of the beltway is the part that essentially is it's not shut down, but it, it goes up to and uh, beyond the key bridge. And because the key bridge won't be being used for quite a few years, that stretch of road will have very little traffic on it. So if this committee in its wisdom chooses to narrow the bill to only cover those portions of the beltway that are not in green here, namely from Interstate 95 on the north, intersecting the Beltway to essentially Interstate 95 on the south and, and cover the area in between all the way along the west side, the north side and the east side of the Beltway. Uh, that would be entirely acceptable. You will see on this sheet of paper, the reports to me were just appalling. In, in five years between 2018 and 2023, there were 13,000 total crashes on the Beltway and 5,000s of those were speed related. Uh, last year, you'll recall, six people died when two cars traveling at very high rates of speed were racing each other, and one of them went off the road in a construction zone and killed six construction workers. Um, so this is a serious problem on the Beltway, and I think I've provided you with the speed camera data, excuse me, the accident data that you need in order to evaluate this bill. Um, and with that, there are two amendments to the bill. Uh, the first just had co-sponsors, and the second amendment uh, provides information about, for example, what happens if there is a stolen car 
and the, the people who stole the car driving, you wouldn't want the owner of the car to be subjected to a $40 fine because the people who stole the car drive. So that's provided for in the bill. I think the bill is pretty comprehensive as currently drafted and amended, and I would recommend it to you and hope for a favorable report. Thank you. It looks like some Baltimore County delegates have some questions for you. Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator, for, sure. for this bill. Um, I am frequently passed by people on the Beltway going much higher it than, is incredible. than the speed limit. It, it really is. Um, so my question, isn't it so that there was a fatal crash just a week ago on the yes. Beltway in southwest Baltimore County? Yes. And this morning I just read, I just got in a notification that the west side of the Beltway, the outer loop down near um, Arbutus is closed down. The left two lanes are closed because of a serious crash. Now, I don't know if someone died, but a serious crash down there. This happens all the time, 5,000 crashes in five years. That's an awful lot of crashes attributable to speed. Delegate Naraki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, good to see you. Uh, thank you for this data. My question, though, from delegation last week still uh, remains. So my commute this morning was over two hours to get here, um, significantly longer than it had been prior to the key bridge being in place. Right. I still have questions about what that's going to look like now that these these data points are probably going to be different uh, with the key bridge no longer being there. To your point, that, that area was the area that was typically green. So now all those cars have now moved to other parts of 695. I couldn't speed on the area of 695 where I live if I wanted to right now uh, because of the, the significant impact of traffic. So how do you kind of mesh that together there with, with this bill? Well, I've driven the Beltway all my life, and there's no question, during a rush hour, it's hard to speed, unless you're a grasshopper and hop over cars, which nobody can do. So, But outside of the rush hour times, early in the morning, when it's still dark outside, before the rush hour starts, during the middle of the day, and in the evening after the rush hour ends, uh, it's very easy to speed. And I know, because I've been driving along the Beltway and I've been, had cars that zip by me at rocket like race of speed during those hours of the day, not during rush hour to be sure, but the other times of the day, absolutely. Okay. And then my follow-up Senator, have, have we done anything with this yet in the house delegation? I'm not aware of us moving no, this bill. Um, uh, Eric Ebersole wanted to wait, Delegate Ebersole wanted to wait until I got the crash data. Okay. And I've now provided it to each member of the house delegation, uh, Baltimore County house delegation as of this morning. And Eric, oh, excuse me, Delegate Ebersole indicated he'd be happy to take the House delegation off the floor if necessary to get a quick vote on this okay. uh, sometime this week. Okay. So you. expect to be tapped on the shoulder and told you need to go out in the hall. Okay. Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Hello, Senator. How Hello. are you? Don't see you enough. One of my Mayor. three delegates. Um. So, you know, I, I'm a fan of using speed monitoring devices. Because I've had the same, a, a similar bill for neighborhoods in our delegation for the past two years. Um, my question about this map, so certainly not opposed to the idea, and I can absolutely see where our constituency would be very much in favor of this. Yeah, look where the red is. Well, that's that's where I'm going. Thank you. <laughs> that's exactly where I'm going with this question. So the red that you all see on this map, and this is directed at the senator as well, is actually the on-ramp and the off-ramp for Highway 83. Highway 83 is also where the Baltimore County speed cameras I mean, excuse me, the Baltimore City speed monitoring devices have been so successful. It's the part that Senator West actually spoke about at the beginning. Um, while I would not at all be opposed to this on 695, my greater concern, to be honest, is 83. And, and while I have, you know, I hate to agree with Elliot Naraki, right now on 695, things are so very, very slow in a lot of those areas because either construction or because of the shutdown on the other side, that 83 is a really big concern. And that happens uh, with speeding traffic more often on 83 North than I think it does to me on 695. So my question is not, um, well, I would say, why doesn't this also include 83? And would you at all be amenable to an amendment adding 83 North to this bill? We, it's awful late in session. My, my feeling is it would be really better to bring a separate bill in 83. I don't, for example, 83 South is the Walter, is the Jones Falls Expressway. Mm -hmm. That has speed cameras. 83 North does not have speed cameras. And that's what I'm referring to. Exactly. Um, I would not be opposed to, I would support a speed camera bill on 83 North, um, but we don't have the crash data. And ba based on the policy of this committee, it's unlikely that we would get the crash data in time to pass that portion, that kind of an amended bill this year. So I re would recommend we do it next year. You and I can co-sponsor co it. 
Okay, well, cross, I'd cross file certainly, it. certainly be happy to do that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I guess with the red being adjacent to 83 and right. not to 695, I guess I would love to consider that conversation, to have that conversation with you after this hearing. Absolutely. Okay, thank yeah. you. No, the, the red is the worst, and it's right there uh, where between the two 83s. Delegate Allen stepped out, so Delegate Stein, do you need a crack? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I'll, I'll just say uh, I, I support this bill, and uh, don't you believe, Senator, that this would at least somewhat reduce speeds on 695, especially the um, the, the hot parts of 695? I sure hope so. Um, I mean, $40, $40 fines are not astronomical. Um, so I'm hoping that it's, it's the fine is high enough to slap people on the wrist, and they won't want to get a second fine, and so they'll slow down. That's my hope. Okay, uh, Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. Um, so who would have access to this speed camera data? Well, the, cam the data would be uh, uh, obtained by the State Highway Administration. There's nothing in the bill that would allow someone to get access to it. There's a bill, is it your bill, in the Senate to restrict data, to access to this sort of data. Um, but I think that, again, that would be a separate bill. It, so the State Highway Administration would obtain the data, and then you'd have to have another bill to make deter to determine who would, other than the policeman who would have to go to court if the person wants to contest their fine, of course, the, that it would be available there. But beyond that, it'd have to be a separate bill to decide what happens ultimately to the data. So you're correct. That is a separate bill. But right. under this bill, who would have access to this data because it's being billed as a speed camera bill. But right. is it your contention that law enforcement would have access to this data for whatever reason, any reason they felt like? I don't know what the law is in that res respect. There is none. There is no law in that respect? No. Well, the State Highway Administration captures the data and retains the data. If the state, if local police forces have some kind of relationship with the State Highway Administration to gain access to the data, then they would get access to the data. Um, I have an it, I have a take on your bill over in the Senate, which we can talk about maybe offline because it's not sure. this bill. There's, nope, that's not this bill, but I'm right. trying to get your understanding of the data in your bill, not right. talking about that bill. Yeah. About this, bill. I, this bill is agnostic as to what happens to the data, other than it being used in court if necessary in order to verify the fact that the person was speeding and owes the $40 fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, that concludes the bill hearing on SB 1067. Thank you, Senator West. We will Thank turn you. to Senator Augustine for a series of bills. We'll start with SB 522, if that works for you, Charter County's enforcement of local laws. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, members of the committee, Senator Malcolm Augustine here on behalf of Senate Bill um, 522, which is a cross file of House Bill 501 um, that has passed this committee um, by Delegate Fennell. So I'd ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 522. Any questions? Okay, we can turn to Senate, uh, SB 659, Prince George's Development Authority. Modifications. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, members of the committee, Senator Malcolm Augustine here on behalf of Senate Bill 659. Um, what S Senate Bill 659 does is it's a, it's a local bill. You have the letter of support from the delegation. The Prince George's uh, Gateway Development Authority was established last year uh, because an area inside of the beltway of Prince George's County um, is a space where we have a naturally occurring uh, artist community and artist spaces, but they really have been under a tremendous amount of pressure um, from cost associated with Washington, D.C. So the charge of this, um, this entity is to develop a plan uh, for this specific area um, that will support artists' um, home housing and also workspaces. What this bill does is it it, it, it sets uh, a parameters for meetings, for meetings, and it also sets that the Prince George's County Redevelopment Authority will be the ones who will support um, with the staffing of the uh, authority to build the report. I, I did this in conjunction with the uh, an agreement from the Redevelopment Authority, and I'd ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 659. Thank you. Any questions on SP 659? 
Okay, let's turn to SB 906, Housing and Community Development, Conversion of Commercial Buildings for Residential Use Report. Thank you, Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, members of the committee, Senator Malcolm Augustine here on behalf of Senate Bill 906, uh, which is a bill that uh, seeks to um, create an inventory of vacant property for that we could then uh, create a statewide approach to, um, to, to this vacant property um, to help address our very, very serious housing crisis. Um, so we have, um, we've had certain pieces of legislation this year that have looked at vacant property. So that has some that suggested that um, we, we um, provide for a, a tool that we would be able to tax them at a different rate. Um, what this bill seeks to do is to um, build the inventory for a statewide approach to vacant property that is commercial, as we know that that things have changed quite a bit uh, from the commercial standpoint, but that our housing crisis is significant and that with this data and with this inventory, we'll be better able to establish uh, a statewide approach um, to, uh, to the housing shortage as it pertains to commercial property. Um, there, there has been uh, some question, one from the, the city of Baltimore, where they had asked about the efficacy of the legislation um, and the staff time, but then they also suggest that they already have uh, a listing of the publicly um, homes that are, I'm sorry, not homes, the properties that are vacant, which would suggest that it's not going to take too much um, for them to actually produce this. But what it could do is allow for us to get a more clear picture of the entire state um, of it. I, I would also say to you all that that's, this is the spirit of the legislation and I'm open to any suggestions or refinements that, that the committee may find um, to make this a more uh, effective tool because that's what it's about. It's about being a tool in the toolbox um, for us to address our affordable housing crisis. I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 906. Thank you. Any questions on SB 906? Delegate Jacobs. Thank you. So, Senator, uh, I noticed in the, this is not a crossfile bill, but in the testimony, there were uh, favorable amendments from uh, Maryland Realtors and uh, MACO. Did you address those issues in in, uh, in the Senate? I, the Senate? I did my best to further define some of the, the terms and to uh, try to, to also sort of narrow the focus. I, I can't say that they were all the way there, but they were um, they were not opposed um, by the time that we voted on the bill. All right, thank you. Yep. Any additional questions? Okay, Senator Augustine, thanks for walking over. We appreciate it. Thank that concludes you. the bill on SB 906. We will turn to Senator Lewis Young, SB 902, Wildlife Protections and Highway Crossings. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of Environment and Transportation. SB 902 is a cross file of HB 1129, and uh, Delegate Ruth authored that bill. So I'm not going to re-explain the bill, but I understand there has been some concern about funding sources. So if I may, I would like to address that. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has allocated $350 million uh, to this specific project, Wildlife Highway Crossings. Several of our neighbors have already taken advantage of it. Virginia has received over 600,000. Pennsylvania recently received over 800,000. Um, and Vermont has received 1,620,000. Program expires in 2026, so we are potentially leaving some money on the table. So why do I think we would be eligible for that? Well, Maryland has the third largest deer population in the country, and two of our counties rank in the top 10. Frederick is number six, and Howard is number 10, which makes sense when you think about it. Two of the fastest growing counties in the state, development is occurring, encroaching on wildlife populations, so lots of accidents. We know there are approximately 33,000 a year, but that's under stated because that's just from State Farm. Doesn't include the other insurance companies and it doesn't include those that aren't reported. 
Another opportunity for us, and I do want to mention that through negotiations, uh, there will be optional donation uh, opportunities on DNR's website, as well as possibly MDOT's uh, website when you go to renew. Colorado has developed a public-private partnership. They got $2 million from this fund, but they their public-private partnership is worth $46 million. And I think there's a potential of that for us. I'll tell you why. Um, Senator Bailey uh, introduced an amendment. If you're not familiar with Senator Bailey, spent about 26 years in DNR, so he really understands this issue. And not only was it a friendly amendment, I think it really enhanced this bill because his amendment required the Maryland Insurance Administration to do a study evaluating the effects of insurance rates based on animal vehicle collisions. And specifically, what does it do uh, to individuals who have claims? So the logical outcome of that is either they could be a potential private partner, as well as other insurance industries, or perhaps they need to re-examine uh, their insurance rates should we move forward uh, with this program. Program. I do want to address um, just two other things. Uh, one, you'll note in the testimony, we have a letter of support from Congressman Trone, uh, largely because he represents the six. 6th District and understands how great a problem this is. And he has also pledged in that letter to do what he can to help us secure federal funding. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, since the fiscal note was revised uh, since the Senate passage of this bill, I think there are a number of errors in the fiscal note um, due to the changes in the bill, because it has been amended quite a bit. Uh, the bill clearly states, due to uh that many of thing, these things will only happen assuming we secure uh, funding. And so two areas of the fiscal note would be irrelevant, uh, the 600,000 and the 744,000, bringing the fiscal note down to about 156,000. And by the way, administrative costs are covered in the federal grant money. Uh, finally, MDOT submitted a letter to the Senate hearing stating that SHA currently is researching what other states are doing and evaluating funding sources using funds on hand, including grants and federal funding. So I think that statement alone um, suggests that some of the items in the updated fiscal note are obsolete or incorrect. Um, and on that note, I'll close and ask for your support of this bill that could reduce Reduce uh, accidents and hopefully our insurance premiums. Thank you, Senator Lewis Young. Any questions on this bill? Delegate Stein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator, um, as well as Delegate Ruth. Thank you very much for bringing this bill. I, I think it is a very important issue. But um, you mentioned uh, items in the fiscal note, $600,000 dollars and seven hundred forty four thousand dollars that are not would not be required and looking at the fiscal note is that the deer survey and maps and other authorized uses that you're saying wouldn't be needed well the bill doesn't require dnr and sha to each hire a uh, new interagency officer so that's one thing uh given that the deer survey is available is subject to available funds and we can use federal funding, there's no reason why we would need state funding for that. Um, and then finally, given that the fiscal note 
it says that SHA requirements are subject to available funding. Uh, we're unclear uh, how SHA could even implement these crossings without the federal funding. So they're putting the cart before the deer. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're Great. welcome. Thanks, Chair Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, just a quick question. Without this bill, could SHA still go decide to go after these funds that you say expire in 2026? I don't believe so. I believe they they would have to have um, our authorization. To go after openly available grant funds? <laughs> I'm going to defer to my co-sponsor, if I may. No, 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 hold, hold, no, on. hold on. No, no, no. no this is, we're not doing a, a okay. multi-member right. panel here. So if you don't know the answer, was, that's fine, Senator Young. My, I'm not 100% positive. It was my understanding that we had to it, officially pass you. this legislation to apply for funds. Great. So, okay. Delegate Ruth, do you have a question? I, I just wanted to ask, um, isn't it so that SHA did not apply for the funds last year? That is true. Thank you. Great. Any additional questions? Okay. That concludes the bill hearing. Thanks for coming over. We will turn to uh, Senator Charles, SB 665, Maryland Condominium Act, amendments to the declaration. Welcome back to the House. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you in that seat. And uh, the vice chair, a lot changes in uh, 365 days. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, and honorable members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. For the record, I am Senator Nick Charles, testifying in support of Senate Bill 665 for the proposed modification will permit the board and, board and Council of Unit Owners to make amendments to their community's Declaration of Covenants with a supermajority of 66 and two-thirds of unit owners as opposed to the current requirement that 80% of the unit owners or mortgagees must support any proposed amendment or change in their community's declaration. This current requirement under the real property statute of requiring 80% of the unit owners and or mortgagees to support any change is exhaustive. It presents an unsurmountable barrier to enact reasonable change, particularly if and when there are lopsided benefits to maintaining the status quo for some unit owners at the expense of others, such as the definition of common elements and how a community's dues are calculated and enforced. This bill was amended from last session and consider, considers the concerns of all stakeholders regarding this new voting threshold being used to change an owner's stake in the property, as well as accounts for other exceptions that would pose significant interference to the property's owner's rights. These exceptions outlined in the current version of the bill eliminates concerns that have previously been posted. Uh, this bill passed this committee unanimously last year, and then it passed the House as well. This year, Senate Bill 665 was voted out of the JPR committee unanimously, unamended, and was voted favorably on the Senate floor 45 to 0 with a bipartisan vote. So I urge a favorable report from this committee as well. Thank you, Senator. Any questions on this bill? Okay, that concludes Bill Hearing SB 665. Uh, is Secretary Flora here? I see you back there. We will turn to SB 309, Sustainable Growth Subcabinet, and repeal of the Office of Smart Growth. Madam Secretary. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Secretary Flora, Department of Planning, for the record. Good to see you all um, back here for the um, amendment to the Smart Growth Subcabinet legislation. Three key things to keep in mind. First, this is really an update to what has been an operational practice for well over a decade since uh, Governor Glenn Denning left office, there has been no office of smart growth inside the governor's office that changed when he left office. So we were simply updating that reality. Um, and with that office, there was a secretary as is common in a governor based office. So we're also updating that aspect of it also. The second thing that we're doing is to really kind of reflect best practices in terms of moving from smart growth to sustainable growth to really reflect all three pillars of sustainability in terms of adding in language specific to equity and resiliency, and then just the name change to reflect that land use is really more 
about where we grow, but how we grow and making that written there. And thirdly, the overall structure. Um, with the change, we're asking that um, the Secretary of Planning be formally made chair of the sub cabinet, which has in fact been the acting practice for some time, that the vice chair be the secretary of DHCD, and that we add one new member, which would be the secretary of Maryland um, Emergency Management. And those are the basics of this particular amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Any questions on SB 309? Okay, that concludes Bill here on SB 309. We will turn to Senator Carroza. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carroza, we have three cross-file local bills that I believe are identical to versions we already passed. We can start with SB 763, sale of property, Revels Neck Road. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair and members of the committee. It's nice to be back. For the record, Senator Mary Beth Carroza representing Somerset County. And these are three important local bills. And the first one is Senate Bill 763. And as has been mentioned by the chair, this the cross file is House Bill 977, which unanimously passed the House before crossover. And this legislation, local enabling legislation, would authorize the Somerset County commissioners to sell in whole or in part Somerset County Industrial Park located at Revels Neck Road under the terms agreed to by the Somerset County commissioners. And um, I asked for a favorable report on SB 763. Thank you. Any questions on 763? Okay, we'll turn to SB 807, Somerset County Fire Rescue and Emergency Medical Services. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next two bills have to do with public safety, and we appreciate your support on this. Again, for the record, Senator Mary Beth Carroza representing Somerset County. Um, Senate Bill 807 is also the cross files House Bill 975, which unanimously passed the House before crossover. And what this bill does, it authorizes the Somerset County commissioners to establish a body to administer the county's affairs when it comes to fire, rescue, and emergency medical services while maintaining their volunteer services. I want to underscore that. This is similar to what 14 other counties um, have across the state, and the Somerset County commissioners need the authorization in order to form this organizational structure, and I ask for a favorable report on SB 807. Thank you. Any questions on this one? Okay, let's go to SB 829, uh, Fire Companies Appropriations. Thank you. This is our third final Somerset County local bill, SB 829. For the record, Senator Mary Beth Carroza, again representing Somerset County. This bill also is the House cross file is 976, which unanimously passed the House before crossover. And um, this is especially important because the our so Somerset County commissioners with this legislation, it would allow them to allocate the appropriate funding for Somerset County's volunteer fire companies from fiscal year 2025 through fiscal year 2030. Uh, important uh, public safety bill for the county. And, uh, and also when you all come to visit, uh, I think it'll make you all feel a little bit safer when you're coming to visit Crisfield and Smith Island and all the other great sites in Somerset County. So I um, move for a uh, favorable adoption of Senate Bill 829. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Okay, that concludes the bill hearing. Thank you. And thank you. Somerset County also thanks you. We will turn to Senator Fel uh, Folden, Frederick County Senator, Sheriff Frederick County Salary Work Group. Senator Folden, welcome home to the House Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back. Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, it's good to see everybody. It's good to be back in ENT. For you today is Senate Bill 562 concerning the sheriff, uh, creating a work group for the sheriff of Frederick County salary study. Long and short of this, instead of a fixed salary attempt uh, to attach the salary, this bill would attempt to create a study to attach the salary to a like law enforcement officer or judicial position within the state to eliminate future petitions to the legislative body regarding salary of the sheriff. It's as simple as I can make it, Mr. Chair. And with that, I would ask for a favorable report on SB 562. Thank you, Senator. Any questions on SB 562? Delegate Holmes. That, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you, Senator. It's good to be seen, Senator. Just, or, I'll, how are you? I, I'm just uh, questioning whether you will be participating in the uh, traditional Seersucker Caucus this year. Mr. You Senator. know, you know, you know better. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Any other really important burning questions? <laughs> okay, Senator, thanks for coming over. Thanks a lot. Uh, Good to see you, Let's turn to, I think, Delegate Hutchinson is uh, filling in on a bill for Dorchester County, HB 596, unless Senator Maltz is handling it. Dorchester County property leases, notice exemptions. Do you want to do that? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is uh, Tom Hutchinson, District 37B from the beautiful Eastern Shore. Uh, I'm here to present House Bill 596. Uh, this bill would allow Dorchester County to enter into a lease for a term of five years or less without providing a published notice of three consecutive weeks in at least one newspaper in general circulation in the county. Um, these leases would be added in an open session agenda to the county Council uh, for review and consideration. Um, a, Dorchester is a small county. There's a, um, a lot of things that are going on, uh, a burden to the county, and they see this as a way to expedite uh, their lease process. So I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 596. Any questions? Okay, well, we'll let's, the next one's identical, so let's just do the next one, then you can do the question. Well, okay, okay, I'll wait. Let's let Senator Mouth talk about SB 810 which I believe is an identical bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished colleagues. It's great to be with you. Uh, the uh, SB uh, 810 is identical to the House bill that you just heard. However, it has a history over in the Senate. It, um, it went with one negative vote in the Senate Triple E Committee. Um, however, that vote switched to a positive and it went unanimously in the full Senate. And that concludes my testimony. I urge your favorable support. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Healy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, since it's identical, either one of you or both of you, to address the uh, opposition letter from the Maryland Delaware DC Press Association, where they state that they believe that this change would uh, lead to more secrecy in government real estate decisions. And even though it is for a lease, it's still a matter of public interest. Would you please? if you have an answer for that. Yeah, just briefly, when we met with the um, county, um, the county felt it was sufficient to have the um, lease item on the county agenda, so it's advertised, and then have it discussed in a public forum. That forum includes um, newspaper reporters, so it's open to the press. Uh, so it, from the county's concern with the way they address this is that they didn't see this to be um, a major concern. Um, their idea of using this is for uh, small parcels, uh, for a term of less than five years where they found it difficult um, because of the three week notice to find a tenant. They've had a hard time getting tenants. Um, and part of the process is of, of doing the publication has that they've actually lost tenants in some, in some of these areas that they're trying to lease. Um, I wouldn't refute what the newspaper association is saying. That's, that's a legitimate argument. However, the argument on behalf of the County was, is that this is open, this is discussed publicly. It's available publicly. Um, it's reported on. Um, and so the idea that this could be done in secrecy um, from their from their view was not a, was not a significant concern. Are the agendas of the, the council meetings published in the newspapers ahead of time as well? So people know that this is going to be on the docket. Yes, they are. So the agenda would be uh, the meeting would be announced, and then the agenda is posted on their website. And how only on the website? It's the, in the newspapers. I don't have an exact answer on whether the agenda goes on the paper. I think it's just the announcement of the meeting is on there, and okay. the agenda is on the website. Thank you. Certainly. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you both. Thank that you. concludes the bill hearing. Do we have Spencer Dixon on behalf of the Anne Arundel County Senators here? SB 658, Anne Arundel County Sheriff's Salary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Spencer Dixon, Legislative Director for Senator Guile, here to present SB 658 on her behalf in her capacity as Chair of the Anne Arundel County Senate Delegation. This bill would require Anne Arundel County to set the salary of the sheriff of Anne Arundel County equal to the salary of a captain 
in the Anne Arundel County Police Department at step 20 in the pay scale. Per the fiscal note, SB 658 would not have a state fiscal impact. In addition to the testimony, members will find a letter attached from the Anne Arundel County Senate delegation affirming its support for this bill. SB 658 is in the exact same posture as its cross file HB 668, which has passed, which has already passed the House of Delegates. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on SB 658. Thank you. Any questions on this bill? Okay, that concludes bill on SB 658. Is someone here on behalf Thank of uh, Senator Hayes? SB 704, appraisal gap from historic redlining financial assistance program alterations. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. For the record, I'm Danielle Ziegler. I'm Senator Hayes' Chief of Staff. So I'm representing him who is in committee today. Uh, I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 704, which aims to expand the eligibility for financial assistance under the appraisal gap for the historic red line financial assistance program. This bill is a cross file of House Bill 873, which passed this chamber favorably. It's in the same posture. So I respectfully ask for a favorable report from this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on SB 704? Okay, thank you. Tell Senator Hayes we said hello. Thank you. Is Lola from uh, Chair Gazzoni's office here? <clears throat> SB 747, Local Government Annual Audit Reporting Requirements Alterations. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lolo Diogue, here on behalf of Senator Gazzoni to present Senate Bill 747, Local Government Annual Audit Reporting Requirements Alterations. Your committee has already heard the cross file of this bill, House Bill 165, which passed the House. The House sponsor, Delegate Lewis, when testifying in front of B&T regarding his bill, said to Chairman Gazzoni, I prefer your form, which I think is slightly stronger. In short, it is creating stronger teeth to auditing for municipalities and counties. Based on that, B&T is amending the House bill to conform with the Senate bill. We urge the committee to pass this bill in its current form. Thank you, and I ask for a favorable report of Senate Bill 747. Thank you. Any questions on SB 747? Delegate Healy. Just want to be clear, um, the House bill, is the House bill still in the Senate or has it come over? I believe it's coming over. It has already come over? Is it been uh, voted on the, on the Senate floor? I'm actually not entirely positive. I can check with my office and uh, get an answer for Thank that. Thank you. But Appreciate that. Of course. Any further questions on this bill? Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes the bill here. I think we have Tamika from Senator McRae's office on SB 891, Transportation, Mobility, Paratransit Service Improvements uh, Study. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tamika Winkler. I'm here on behalf of Senator Corey McCray's office. Um, I'm here in reference to SB 891, a cross file, and it has been passed in the same posture to HB 1199, sponsored by Dele Delegate Edelson. The purpose of the bill, the purpose of Senate Bill 891 proposes a study to conducted by the Maryland Transportation Institute at the University of Maryland to identify methods to enhance the Maryland Transit Administration's ADA mobility link paratransit service. This study aims to address challenges and improve services for individuals with disabilities. I am encouraging a favorable vote for SB 891. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on SB 891? Delegate Huey. Thank you. I just want to, is this in the same posture as the, as the House bill? Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I think there's actually one minor difference, Delegate Huey, but the sponsor is okay with taking the Senate version. So we will work through it. Uh, okay. We have, I believe, Mariana from Senator Carter's office. Is she here? SB 1033, Maryland Building Performance Standards, Local Request for Guidance, Religious Considerations. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mariama Cham, a staffer in Senator Joe P. Carter's office, and today I'll be testifying on behalf of Senate Bill 1033, Maryland Building Performance Standards, Local Request for Guidance, Religious Considerations. 
Senate Bill 1033 will require that the Maryland Department of Labor on request by a local jurisdiction and in consultation with the Office of the Attorney General to provide guidance for the implementation and enforcement of the Maryland Building Performance Standards in relation to any religious observance, practice, or belief. Currently, Maryland law states that the Maryland Department of Labor incorporates by reference the International Building Code, including the International Energy Conservation Code, with modifications as Maryland Building Performance Standards. Each local jurisdiction must implement and enforce the most current version of MBPS and any local amendments to MBP MBPS. In addition, any modification um, adopted by the state after December 31st, 2009 must be implemented and enforced by a local jurisdiction no later than 12 months after the modifications are adopted by the state. In addition, the bill would modify the public safety article in which the building performance standards are addressed by incorporating a pro pro prohibition allowing a local jurisdiction to request input from the Attorney, General, Attorney General's office on how to appropriately address religious concerns when and where they arise and are presented. This will resolve any potential issues that arise of religious observance relating to the standards without affecting the intent of the IECC. As such, I re we respectfully urge you to issue a favorable, before, favorable report on Senate Bill 1033. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, are there any questions? Okay. Thanks for being with us. That concludes the uh, bill here on SB 1033. I believe we have Natalie from Senator Kelly's office for SB 943, Better Bus Service Act of 2024. And I don't know, is Charlie Scott with you on the panel, Natalie? Great. Bring up Charlie Scott from Wilmot. Good afternoon, Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, members of the committee. I am Natalie Lynch, Senator Kelly's Chief of Staff, and I'm here to present Senate Bill 943, the Better Bus Service Act of 2024 on behalf of Senator Kelly. You may recognize Senate Bill 943 as it is similar to Delegate Lewis's House Bill 107 that passed out of the House, but it is not in the same exact posture. Senate Bill 943 allows bus-mounted enforcement of several parking violations that interfere with transit service, including bus lanes, bus stops, curb ramps, bike lanes, double parking, and any zone prohibited by a sign. House Bill 107 restricts the enforcement to only bus lanes. So this restriction would prevent enforcement of parking violations that block access to bus stops and curb ramps that are critical to allow riders to safely board or to exit a bus. When a bus stop is blocked, it does require the riders to walk into an active lane of traffic, posing serious risks for the disabled community and seniors. I really appreciate that multiple advocates from the National Federation of the Blind are here today to show their support for Senate Bill 943. Uh, the Judicial Proceedings Committee did pass Senate Bill 943 with an amendment that creates an exception to allow brief stops in dedicated bus lanes for picking up and dropping off passengers. We are aware that WMATA has concerns surrounding the implementation of this amendment, and you will hear more from Mr. Charlie Scott on WMATA's concerns today. Senator Kelly urges the House to ensure that the final bill passed by the legislature includes protections beyond just bus lanes, especially for illegal parking at bus stops and curb ramps. Senator Kelly is aware that Chair Corman and Chair Smith have been in communication on this bill, and she trusts that they will come to an agreement so we can move forward with this important policy. I thank you for your time and urge a favorable report. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the, of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie Scott. I'm the Senior Government Relations Officer uh, for Metro. Um, and as uh, was mentioned, you know, at Metro, we have started a program very similar to this in the District of Columbia. We started bus stop enforcement last fall, bus lane enforcement uh, earlier this year. And as was mentioned, uh, this bill, Senate Bill 943, does include an amendment that uh, we've reviewed and on our analysis, we don't think it would be easy to impl implement. Bottom line is that it would either add cost to Metro, add cost to the local jurisdictions, uh, parking enforcement agencies, and or um, let real violations go uh, unticketed. Um, and as was mentioned also, definitely want to highlight the need for this bill to include bus stop en enforcement. Um, for reference, in the district, our program covers 3,000 bus stops and 12.7 miles of dedicated lanes. So having this bill cover bus stops really makes this bill beneficial for all riders, uh, no matter what type of bus route they're on, whether that bus route includes dedicated lanes or not. And as was mentioned, you know, for all riders, it's inconvenient when the bus 
can't pull up to your stop, but especially for our uh, ADA uh, community, it's very vital that the buses have unfettered access to the bus stops in the region. So for those reasons, I urge a favorable report uh, with amendments. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I understand, Charlie, um, I love a good bus and I don't like when my bus stop is blocked. But as I've always understand this, this is about dedicated bus lanes, the, the painted red lanes that you have in D.C. and hopefully more and more in Montgomery County. But are you saying that all the metro buses like the J2, which doesn't have dedicated lanes, they would also have activated cameras in Montgomery County under this bill to make sure that no one's blocking the, you know, when I got on at the Bethesda metro station? Yes. I mean, if this, I consider this enabling legislation. So if this is uh, um, passed, then local jurisdictions would have the ability to uh, have tickets issued in either bus lane violations or bus stop violations. So, so right now, you know, if a bus pulls up near a bus stop and that bus stop is is blocked by a vehicle, often what happens, you know, depending on, on what's, what the situation is, that bus may stop in a regular lane of traffic impeding all the motors behind that bus, bus, you know, everyone trying to board the bus will just walk across the lane, get onto that bus. But of course, that's, you know, for able-bodied people who can easily get from the curb to a bus that's uh, a lane away. If it's, uh, if they're disabled, then they just, either the bus, they can't re access the bus or, I mean, it's just problematic. Right, I'm just make sure I understand. Yeah. So in, in DC, one Metro bus has, bus stop and bus lane enforcement. Yes, exactly. Montgomery, if this bill passed, could have just bus lane enforcement and Prince George's County could have nothing. Exactly. It, 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 we worked with the jurisdictions based on, on what they would want enforced in their local jurisdiction. So, okay. so in the district, they've chosen to implement bus stop and bus lane in, in enforcement. In fact, in the district, we started, as I mentioned, we started the bus stop enforcement ahead of the bus lane enforcement. Okay. Thank you for... I think clarifying Delegate fully. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, Charlie, I'd like to know, I'd like you to go back to the amendment that mm -hmm. you referenced that you have an issue with, that WMATA has an issue with. And I thought I heard you say that it would make it more costly and that it would make it for WMATA and that it would make it, um, it would make it difficult to enforce um the actual blocking. Can you explain why? Certainly. So yeah, yeah. I, I asked our, our very bright staff to figure to, to look at the bill as amended and said, could we implement this? And, and the, the bottom line was that yes, we could, but it would not that but there were challenges in any creative idea of, of how we could uh, implement it. We could, you know, allow a rule where it said, all right, if you if a if a camera catches a, a car stops, you know, right here, we won't issue a ticket unless another boss farther back sees that exact exact same car in that exact spot. But that would require that all of our buses have camera technology. It would mean that all the local buses traveling in that lane that don't have the technology would also be impeded by that vehicle. So, and just our buses, some of our routes, you know, 12 minutes between buses. So a car could be in that spot for over 12 minutes. And if it's only detected once, then they wouldn't get, get a ticket. The other option would be to send a video clip to the parking enforcement agency and ask them to have a person look at the clip, try to dis discern whether or not the vehicle stopped is picking so someone up, dropping someone off. It's a judgment call. Um, we think it would be something that people could dispute. So it would be more costly for the agency to have someone actively trying to review, trying to determine what they think that that car was stopped there for. And then we think also it would be something that someone could try to dispute uh, in court. So yeah. I, no, there was no good solution that we could come okay. up with. I, I didn't want to argue with you, but it, it no. just, it seems like it does. The bill does say a brief stop, yes. number one. And number two, it does seem like you can tell if someone's being picked up uh, or not, uh, or if the car is just well, sitting there. We, we understand the, the intent, I just, yeah. but as we went through how we would implement it, just, there was it no just easy way to implement okay. it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just ask another question. Since my seatmate's not here, I'll, I'll direct this at you, Charlie, Mr. Scott. Um, in D.C., who can access the data from the Metro bus cameras? That uh, that data is sent directly to the um, to to DDOT. So so it's um, it's transmitted, and and then uh, it's more enumerated in this legislation about the the retention of, of the data. But basically, what 
this bill has in terms of data retention is similar to what we have in practice with, with the district. That's not part of the DC statute, but that is you know kind of a best practice that we've implemented in DC. And do you know who can access the DDOT data once they have it? They, I mean, if if I believe it can be subpoenaed by 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 uh, law enforcement, but generally it's just the the parking enforcement entity that that has access to to that data. Everyone, make sure to tell Delegate Love that I asked. <laughs> Any additional questions? Okay, that concludes the uh, bill hearing. Thank you both very much. Is anyone here on behalf of Senator Galleon? Come on down. SB 838, Vehicle Laws Lighting Privately Owned Vehicles. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, committee members. For the record, Jordan Glassman representing Senator Jason Galleon to introduce SB 838, Vehicle Laws Lighting Privately Owned Vehicles. SB 838 is identical to its cross-file HB 782, sponsored by your own Delegate Stein. Uh, we'd like to thank the committee for its unanimous vote for HB 782 and request a favorable vote for SB 838 as well. Thank you. Are there any questions on this bill? Okay, thank you very much. That concludes the thank bill you. hearing and all our bill hearings today. Colleagues, we'll take a break till 3.10, so about 14 minutes. Stretch your legs and we will come back for a voting session. Thank you all so much.